Well, uh, it's about that time. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our weekly Forage and Livestock Town Hall meeting. Uh, my name is Eric Bailey. I'm a state beef extension specialist uh, based out of Columbia. I will be the host for today. Uh, Druba DeCall, a uh, field specialist in agronomy, is um, going to be the co-host. The same thing that we always do with our, our forage livestock town halls. We'll have a, a weather report from Dr. Pat Kanan come up first. And then today on our educational topic, we have Dr. Mary Janowski from the University of Nebraska talking about utilizing cover crops with, uh, with beef cattle. So um, feel free to ask questions through, throughout the presentation. You can either um, type them in the chat and they go public or uh, Druba has changed his, his name on the chat screen to ask questions here. If you would like the questions to be anonymous, go ahead and type them, direct message them to ask questions here, and he will, uh, he will relay them to our, to our speaker. So um, with that, I will go ahead and, and move this along. Dr. Ganan, are you uh, ready to go? I am, um, Eric, thanks. I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll, we'll get going here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for providing the opportunity to give a weather report today for the week. Welcome to August. It's a classic uh, weather pattern that's settled in over the past oh, week or two with uh, scattered day-to-day -day chances of showers and thunderstorms and um, this map here is, across, is southern Missouri. That's where the rains were mostly confined to over the past 24 hours. These are Coker Ross reports from uh, this morning. So it's from 7 a.m. Uh, yesterday to 7 a.m. this morning. And we have some really good representation of rain gauges here in southwestern Missouri. And you can really see the hit and miss nature of these showers and thunderstorms. If you're lucky enough to be under one of those storms, you're gonna get a good drink of water. And that was the case. Look at this here in Northwest of Springfield, near Ash Grove, they had over two inches. And then right over here in Dade County near Greenfield, they had another two inch report, but just a few miles away, there was only two tenths in the gauge. So it just really shows the whimsical nature of the who gets the rain and who hasn't been getting it. Uh, some badly needed rain here in, in parts of Jasper and in Newton County. They had a, a, an inch and three quarters in northwestern Newton County near Shoal Creek Estates. And then out right here outside of Carl Junction, they had a little over an inch. But you can see, again, the scattered nature as you look across southern Missouri, who got some of the rain and who missed out. But hopefully uh, some of these areas in southwest Missouri where it's been very dry um, can pick up some more of these scattered showers and thunderstorms over the next few days. This is a radar estimate of, of rainfall over the past seven days since we last met. Uh, West Central Missouri got a really good drink of water last week with some decent rainfall that was badly needed. It was very dry in West Central sections. The, these yellow areas are two or more inches of rain here south of St. Joe down to south of Kansas City. Uh, right here in Cass County, they got some big rains that were badly needed. And the, in the table here at the bottom, you can see some of those reports over five inches in Southeast Missouri, they had some good rainfall over the past week here in Butler County. And then Harrisonville had over five inches. Wapapello, Down in, Wapapello Dam here in Southeast and Wayne County had over well, almost five inches of rain. But nonetheless, there was some decent rainfall in these areas of green, a half to one inch, a little over an inch across parts of Central Missouri. But Southwest Missouri, again, just sort of missing out on that. And this is the rainfall over the past 30 days to really sort of indicate over the past four weeks who's been missing out on these rain events. Any of these light green colors or bluish colors is where the rains have been missing, folks. And as far southwestern parts of the state here in McDonald County, Newton County, over in parts of Berry County, less than less than a, a quarter of an inch for the past four weeks. So if you here we are in the middle part of August and they've had only seven hundreds in McDonald County, just west of Anderson. You know, you're going to see some impacts and that's what we're seeing. The lawns and pastures, they're they're turning brown. The grasses have stopped growing and some of the uh, some of the trees are starting to drop some of those leaves. So hopefully with the chances of rain over the next few days, we'll, we can fill in some of these gaps of lack of precip. It looks like a little bit of a corridor that extends from southwest Missouri into parts of central sections where they've just been missing out on some of these rainfall. Northeast Missouri, parts of southeast Missouri, and parts of west central Missouri 
that's where the decent rains have been falling. And you can see here some of the, on the table on the lower left, anywhere from over six to over eight inches of rain in parts of these counties and these heavier concentrations of rainfall. We are in uh, an unsettled pattern over the next few days. I think our best chances of rainfall statewide will be tomorrow into tomorrow night. Uh, today, it looks like best chances. There is a little bit of a, if you were to look at the radar, there's a pretty good area of showers and thunderstorms in parts of Oklahoma and Arkansas that's moving to the Northeast. That will, as the day wears on with warmer temperatures and the heat of the day, that will, will we'll see more pop-up thunderstorms fire up, especially across Southern and Western parts of the state. Generally 30 to 60% chances across Southern Missouri. That's the best chances for today. That will expand statewide as we go into tomorrow and tomorrow night. There is a forecast of a cold front to move through the state beginning late tomorrow into tomorrow night. That will bring more widespread chances statewide. These are seasonable temperatures, generally in the mid 80s to lower 90s. Not That's pr pretty typical for this time of year. Those chances will persist across southern Missouri because that front is forecast to stall out. And so that will bring the uh, Again, some more scattered chances of showers and thunderstorms, especially across southern and far southern Missouri as we go into weekend. And then we're back into the furnace on Monday and Tuesday of next week with the heat and humidity with highs in the mid to even upper 90s on Monday. And that will extend into Tuesday again with high humidities that will lead, lead to some high heat indices, definitely into triple digits by early next week. And that's indicative of a map here that we're showing where the heat returns early next week with those heat indices in the 100 to 105 degree range on Monday and Tuesday. This is a forecast of precipitation over the next three days. That's our best, best chances across Missouri for some notable precipitation uh, starting mostly tomorrow into tomorrow night. Again, those Southern Missouri might will see some scattered shower thunderstorms. If you're lucky enough to be under one of those thunderstorms, you're going to get more than what they're representing here. This is such a this is a generalized map of what to anticipate over the next three days, but it does look like the highest likelihood for heavier precip, generally between a half to an inch of rain over the southern third of the state. And for next week, this is the forecast August 24th to the 28th. That takes us into the last week of August. Uh, it does look like an enhanced likelihood of above normal uh, temperatures across all of Missouri. Again, that would put highs in the 90s throughout much of next week and perhaps in the mid to upper 90s on Monday and Tuesday. There are indications of another system impacting our state by mid to late week next week. That's what we see here on the right. There is a little bit of an enhanced likelihood of above normal precip uh, in far southwestern parts of the state, and that's where they need it the most. So hopefully this forecast will verify for next week, but definitely the heat is on especially starting next week, but again, with some chances of precipitation by mid to, let, mid to late next week. Eric, that's pretty much a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks so much. Pat, I really appreciate the report as always, my friend. Thank you for, for joining us this week and every week as, as you've done for, for over a year now. So, Druba, are there any questions for, for Dr. Ganan? Uh, no questions so far, Eric. Okay. All righty. Well, we'll go ahead and keep uh, keep the trains moving, and we'll uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Mary Drunowski from the University of Nebraska. She will be our featured speaker this week, um, talking about some of the work that they have, her and her colleagues have done at the University of Nebraska, um, utilizing cover crops um, for with, or by beef cattle. So, Mary, go ahead and take it away. have to unmute. <laughs> I do it all the time. No worries. Uh, no worries. Anyways, uh, thank you, Eric. So I'm going to talk about using cover crops for forage um, just to give you guys a little bit of understanding about my location. I am housed in Lincoln and most of my research and most of the work I do would be either north of Lincoln a bit um, up in Mead. And so that would be, if you want to think about it, it's, it's basically parallel with the center of Iowa. So a bit north of Missouri or down in South central uh, Nebraska. And it would basically on, be on the same parallel as uh, Northern Missouri. So with that in mind, it does change things a little bit in terms of some suggested dates. 
um, and I'll try to remember uh, to, to maybe put it in context for uh, what we would think about um, in Missouri. Uh, I've been at Nebraska for about seven years. And uh, during that time, uh, focused a lot on using cover crops. It's, a, it's of course, a big interest of uh, producers in the state. And in particular, a lot of my focus has been growing cattle. Um, so I'm going to have some sprinkling in of growing cattle uh, data as well as cow uh, information. And I'll try to, to talk about um, things you need to consider for both of those. So the first point I really want to make when we're thinking about cover crops is that timing is extremely important. And it's, um, it's narrow window, windows, of course, for us when we talk about uh, that fall period in terms of that late summer planting, uh, when we could get enough biomass for grazing uh, in the fall or winter compared to, to, to compared to you guys, but it's extremely important to realize that planting date makes a huge difference in the expected outcomes. Um, so I've kind of have on here kind of three, uh, well, excuse me, four different breakdowns of, of planting dates and what we might suggest for you to plant based off of when you can plant them. I will tell you that um, thinking about where you're at, so thinking about Missouri, I probably could back up uh, some of these dates by two to three weeks. So like we look at um, warm season, uh, summer annuals, uh, for us, if we plant them any later than August 1st, we're not going to get much growth. I would suspect uh, you guys are two to three weeks later than that and you could still get um, substantial growth. Um, the same thing holds true here for the winter sensitive species. And what I'm talking about, most people would think about winter sensitive cool seasons. I'm talking about oats, I'm talking about brassicas. Um, August 30th or September 1st is like a drop dead date uh, for us. Um, we get very little performance out of those crops after that date. Um, they just don't have enough growing degree days or temperature uh, really to make much biomass. So um, I'm really going to focus on uh, these two in red. However, I do have some information if you're really interested on summer annuals. Uh, but a lot of where we focused our, our uh, interest early on has been these winter sensitive cool season species. And in particular, thinking about uh, what can we get in after early harvested corn silage, after uh, wheat or after another, um, say, a summer annual, uh, what can we do to be able to get even more growth uh, for that fall winter grazing? So I'm gonna start here thinking about late summer planting. And I do wanna tell you, there's a lot of options out there. I'll tell you my two favorites at the moment really are oats and rapeseed. Um, and I like them in a mix together. So one thing I want to point out is I know radishes are quite popular and so are turnips uh, as a cover crop, but I actually, for, for actual late summer planting, I think rapeseed is a better bet um, for a couple different reasons. Uh, one of which is that what we notice, especially with cattle that aren't used to grazing uh, brassicas, they tend to eat the tops off first and then you kind of have to force them into eating the bulbs. And what that means is that I basically can't manage ground cover very well. I either have to strip it or not use the bulbs at all. Rapeseed puts all of its energy into producing leaf and the amount of biomass it produces is as good or better than um, radishes and turnips. If it's a longer growing period, it can actually be better than those two. It's also cheaper. Um, so it's about a dollar a pound. It has the same seed size as a purple top turnip, which is very, very small. So a little bit goes a long way. And so it's a, it's a great way to cheapen up a mix. And I will also want to point out here that it has a tap root rather than producing those tubers. And that's actually a benefit from the standpoint of people who have goals for compaction uh, mediation. So I know a lot of people love radishes for that. Uh, however, we actually have some data from one of our uh, extension engineers that actually shows that the radish actually causes more sidewall compaction because of the way it grows. So it kind of 
instead of just pressing down and pushing apart, it actually starts growing outward and causes like the ring around where it grew to be more compacted. Uh, whereas the, the rapeseed actually kind of separates um, the soil. So if you're looking for uh, some compaction remediation, uh, rapeseed's uh, kind of nice for that as well. The other benefit, as I said, rapeseed's cheap. So we did a bunch of plot work very early on to try to figure out how much uh, rapeseed we would need in a mix with oats to get a similar yield to an oat monoculture. And compared to 100 pounds of oats, 50 pounds of oats plus three pounds of rapeseed yields the same. Uh, and what's cool about it is that this costs us about 15 bucks an acre for the mix, and it's about 20 to 25 for the oats alone. Um, so we cheapened up the mix and we actually get a greater performance on calves. So the feed value is actually higher. And I know some of you may be looking at this and going, there's no way you can statistically pick that up. But it is uh, consistent enough. We have done it uh, for three years now and it, it shows up every time that we get just a slightly better performance out of those who have access to the rapeseed. So similar yield, a little bit better performance and cheaper seed, why not? Um, that's kind of my thought process anyways. Um, one other note for those of you who do want to graze calves, I think if you want to graze cows, this works really well too, especially if they're lactating um, because they have those high requirements. Um, and you can see that they're definitely some high quality feed here. Uh, but the other thing I think that's worth noting about this is that we actually see um, greater marbling out of the calves that came off the oat and rape seed compared to the oats alone, which I have no idea why that is. We actually waited um, until we had this last year of data because I kept thinking it was a fluke, um, but it's been consistent. So it's kind of interesting. We were getting about 50% choice off of the oats once we put them through um, the feedlot and finished them versus uh, about 60 on the oats plus rape seed. So Kind of a little side note, but very interesting. So one of the fields or one of the things that we really have focused on a lot has been corn silage fields because you have that bare ground. It's, I mean, it is ripe for the picking to put in a, a cover crop. Now I'll tell you, as I said, for us, September 1st is kind of the date for which we really need to switch to something that's winter hardy and, and plan on getting spring um, forage, whether that be for grazing or um, to harvest as silage, for instance. Um, so we've actually focused a lot on early harvested corn silage fields. Um, these fields are all uh, been harvested about um, the August 25th for us. And you can see um, this brassica and oats, we get a lot of yield. And depending on how we graze it, um, we can get a lot of grazing or we can get a little grazing which we'll, we'll talk about here in just a second. I did want to show you this picture of, uh, of this pivot. Um, I realize you guys likely do not have very many pivots out there, but this we were just using it to strip graze um, because we had a pivot fence. And boy, could we really get, these were spring calving cows, so lower requirement over the fall and winter. Um, so we could really crank down how much access we gave to those cows in terms of we were limiting uh, there basically we were limit feeding. And Drew, did you have a question? Okay. Um, so we were limit feeding these cows with this pivot fence and boy, did we get a lot of, um, of grazing off of it, about four AUMs per acre, which uh, is pretty amazing. So that would be, um, the equivalent of about four cow months, if that makes sense per acre. So I said timing was everything and I just wanted to show you how dramatic that really is. So this was um, in a field where we harvested part of the field is corn silage and we were able to plant oats on September 3rd or we waited two weeks and um, planted on September 17th and it's night and day in terms of the yields that we were getting, basically a ton and a half versus 500 pounds an acre. Um, this does not pay. Uh, planting that late does not pay, I can tell you. We were trying to use it as a supplement for corn residue, but the calves uh, 
when you have corn residue in the field, they just eat all the oats first and then they eat the corn residue. So it didn't really work very well. Uh, one of the things that was really shocking to me early on was the fact that looks are deceiving. So here's a picture of the oat and brassica when uh, we were right after like kind of the first frost. So it's November 6th, uh, it looks green, still looks pretty good. And then we go a month later and it's all melted over. Um, you know, it's not two inches tall um, and it's brown and ugly, right? So I would have expected a much greater loss in energy and protein than what we observed. And in fact, um, while you can see here that early on, the energy value of the oats and brassicas, this was about 30% brassica on a dry matter basis, which is about what that three pounds of rapeseed and 50 pounds of oats results in, by the way. Um, so this was 78% TDN. That's better than corn silage and 23% crude protein. So it's kind of like alfalfa hay mixed with corn silage. Um, what's not to love? Uh, and then by the time we get into December, um, we're still just a little bit lower than corn silage now on TDN. We're 67% TDN, um, still really high, better than any uh, premium quality hay you might have available. And again, uh, we didn't lose crude protein. What we lose is we lose sugar. So these plants really accumulate a lot of sugar uh, late in the fall and over that winter, we just lose that sugar content. So um, we do lose some protein, but because we lose uh, uh, relatively a greater amount of sugar it ends up having the same concentration of protein. So I wanted to show you performance of calves to make two points. One of which is quality is really good. Um, these are uh, some, these are all fall winter grazing situations some of which were multi-species mixes that may have had some warm season in them, but they were all predominantly either oats or oats plus a brassica, you know, turnip, radish, or rapeseed. And if you look at this, you might say, okay, what's going on here with number four and number five? So these two different trials. Well, if I put the years on there, um, it starts making more sense. This particular year happened to be a year where we got a lot of precipitation events. Um, and so while they were out grazing, so they had wet hair coats, couple that with moderately cold temperatures, and they just had to use a lot of energy to stay warm. So performance varies a lot, and it appears to be very uh, dependent on what the weather does. So the more rain or snowfall we get, the lower the performance is. But even at 1.3 pound a day, that's still pretty good gains on, um, on five, 600 pound calves. Uh, so if we look at just the mean across all of those trials, we're still at two pound a day. For those of you who think about cows, what would it be equivalent to in AUMs per acre? Um, again, it ranged quite considerably from um, this 0.7 up to about two AUMs with a mean of 1.4. Now, key thing here to understand is that uh, we reset stocking. That means that we basically, we fence the field, um, we put calves in usually about one calf an acre, and then we let them graze until the forage is limiting. So, this is the AUMs we were able to get when we grazed by that method. And this would be the cost per AUM. So this is basically, think about it kind of like the cost per cow month is a little bit uh, less than the cost per cow month because most people's cows nowadays are 1,300 pounds rather than 1,000. Um, so just to give you uh, on a cow day cost, it was 1.5. Um, Dollar, so a dollar fifty three uh, per cow per day if we were to have grazed cows on this. Now, a couple key things here. One of which is if I have spring calving cows and I set them out onto those oats or oats and brassicas, I'm way more than meeting their needs. So doing something like strip grazing and limiting access um, can really increase the uh, amount you get out of the forage as well as reduce the costs kind of makes sense. 
Um, I'll show you here in just a second. We've actually done a little bit of, of studies just looking at that. I did want to show you that I we started really realizing this is all just the studies with oats, oats alone, grazing in the fall and winter. I don't really think you need to look at all these numbers, but I wanted you to look at harvest efficiency because a lot of times I get a question that's like, how much grazing can I get if I plant this, right? So if you plant late summer, you plant oats, you get about, two ton, about a ton to a ton and a half of um, dry matter per acre, which is about what we get if we plant them um, in late August, how much grazing can I get? Well, I showed you those AUMs per acre of about 1.4, but the key thing here is that we aren't actually getting really great harvest efficiencies, um, ranging anywhere from about 40% harvest efficiency, meaning only about 40% of, of what is available is actually consumed, um, or excuse me, I shouldn't even say that, it actually disappears, <laughs> which means that some of that is trampling mosses. And actually I would argue a lot of that is trampling mosses. Uh, and down to uh, 13%. This 13% um, was a year, it was wet when they got turned out and boy, they trampled a lot in. And you can see the amount of biomass to begin with wasn't that much less than some of the other years. In fact, it was um, greater than 2019, but we got way more grazing out of 2019 all weather related. So weather plays a big deal on how much grazing we can get. And of course, grazing management. On average, we were about 30% harvest efficiency. So if somebody is trying to do the math to figure out um, how much grazing can I get, if you have an idea or an estimate of the initial biomass, you need to assume only about 30% of that can be um, intake. Now, uh, out at U.S. Mark, which is down in South Central Nebraska, we also uh, graze cows on these um, oat brassica mixes. And in this case, we're doing a move about every uh, three to four days, up to about a week, depending on um, the particular group and, and um, who's managing them. But I wanted to show you that with just some allocation, and some better weather. Uh, one of the things about going to South Central Nebraska is that we tend to be a little bit drier um, than we are up in Eastern Nebraska. So I think there's a combination of things going on here. But I wanted to show you we were 30% set stocking and we were 60% if we did some allocations. And on average, you know, you can see we doubled uh, the amount of utilization we got out of that forage. It's not because there was that much more uh, biomass production. So the next thing we did was really to look at uh, a side-by-side -side comparison of strip grazing versus set stocking. So strip grazing in this case is basically giving them uh, three days worth at a time and just moving the fence forward as we went um, versus putting all the calves out into um, the field at once. And what we saw with side-by-side -side comparisons is that we could basically gain about 46% increase in animal grazing days. So if you think about that, um, I gained um, about 50% the amount of forage out of that deal. So it was well worth the labor to be able to better utilize the forage. However, there is one caveat and we do get a reduction in average daily gain if we're using calves. So a little bit of a decrease in um, the, probably the intake actually of the animals because we probably are limiting them towards the end of our strip grazing. And of course your management will have an impact on how uh, that balances out. In this case, we were trying to get them to graze down to about two inches and we would change our movements because of that. So still though, if I look at, <clears throat> if I was grazing calves, two pound a day versus 1.7, I think that still looks pretty good in terms of performance. It did still come out to be quite economical. If I'm doing cows, it makes a lot of sense. I should point out, 
we've been grazing fall calving cows on oats for about the past three years. What we do is that we calve the cows out. And then um, when we go to start breeding, we actually move them to the oats. And these late summer planted oats, as you could see, were very, very high quality. And we thought they would be perfect for breeding on. We have um, gotten very good breed up. We've not had any kind of problem in compared to um, our spring calving cows. However, one thing we have noticed is that uh, we've had a significant increase in the number of twins. <laughs> and we're not exactly sure why, but in all three years, um, we have gotten um, six to 10% twinning rate in the cows that were bred on the oats. So that's something we're trying to, to learn a little bit more about. Um, so cows breed up well. Um, the calves perform decently. I will tell you that, uh, you know, when, what we do after that is uh, weaning those calves and then we put them into the dry lot. And I'll tell you, they don't perform very well over the winter in dry lot. Um, so that system probably doesn't work very well, but the oats work great for breeding. This is the data I was talking about with the, using the pivot fence and getting uh, grazing efficiency. So I've showed you that set stocking, we got about 1.3 AUMs per acre, uh, 1.4. Um, and then if we do uh, some strip grazing where we're allocating about three to seven days worth at a time, we're doubling that, we're getting about two. Um, AUMs per acre. And if we daily allocate, and especially if we're trying to limit feed because they're dry cows and using this high quality forage, we can get up to about four AUMs per acre, which is pretty doggone amazing. Um, they were getting about 400, about 400 cows were getting about an eighth of an acre a day. Um, and I was just amazed at how well that worked out for them. They maintain condition just fine. Um, and we got a lot of forage out of the deal. Now, um, briefly, I wanted to talk about fall planting because I think that's something that a lot of people think about and probably most common that everybody thinks of is cereal rye. It's quite winter hardy. We'll point out, and especially for you guys, um, there's a benefit in looking for a southern rye versus uh, even a variety non-stated that's likely a northern rye um, in the fact that it comes out of dormancy earlier and that means it's available to harvest, whether that be grazing or, um, or silage earlier. Um, so if you're trying to double crop, that really makes uh, a benefit. If you're trying to even just get some grazing earlier until your pastures are ready, um, going with a southern rye like Elbon rye uh, can really be quite beneficial. Negative to that is it also goes through maturity quicker. Um, so if you're trying to use it for harvesting, um, you've got narrower windows to harvest. We've done quite a bit of, of work looking at rye, triticale, and even wheat. Um, and I'll tell you that we really just don't see a whole lot of differences in terms of yields. Um, this one, you can see barley did not uh, level up. Winter barley just doesn't seem to work very well for us. Um, spring barley, on the other hand, compared to oats, a lot of times looks pretty good depending on the variety. But I wanted to show you this because I really just wanted to point out, I think a lot of people think of cereal rye and they think low quality. It can be low quality um, if you let it get mature. Uh, once that head comes out, it is fairly low quality, um, but not any different from triticale or even wheat. So early on, if it's vegetative, it's very high quality and sufficient for a lactating cow. Management is the key there. You got to have enough for them to be able to get full mouthfuls and graze, and you can't let it get ahead of you and get too mature. That's probably the hardest part with managing it. So we've grazed a lot of 700 pound calves and we get outstanding performance. This trial, they were getting 3.2 pound a day gain on Elbon Rye. We were just managing our grazing to where we kept it, we were trying to keep it uh, between two and eight inches. Um, sometimes that's a little bit difficult, but having the right stocking rate is key. Um, and so a lot of times that means you may need to have a backup plan if you get, if 
you get ahead of it. I would rather stock too heavy and have to feed some hay or move to something else than stock too light and let it get away from me. Um, we did rye triticaline wheat uh, this particular year. We were getting about four pound a day gain, and that's actual gain. We limit fed at the beginning and at the end. This is not a difference in fill. It's just really high quality stuff if you keep it vegetative. Um, so I think uh, people underestimate the value. What we have to concentrate on is the grazing management. And then I just wanted to point out that if you're going to harvest these, um, choosing when to harvest is key in terms of yield, but also in terms of quality. So uh, boot stage is basically before the head comes out. And thesis is when that pollen comes out. And then most people would know what milk is, but basically you have seed in there. And if you were to squeeze it, it comes, has a milky substance that comes out. Um, you can see that yield doubles between boot and soft dough, and that's pretty consistent across all of the species. This one here, I will tell you, um, we had a problem with lodging on the wheat. Um, it did fall over and it was really hard to get completely harvested. That's why this yield kind of dipped here. I really don't think that, depending on what variety you use, I don't think this is indicative that all wheat's going to have that problem. Um, but the big story is yield doubles um, as you get more mature. Protein decreases. That's kind of to be expected. So depending on what you're trying to use it for, um, you may choose to harvest at a certain time to get the protein density you're looking for. Like last year, I know we had some producers who decided to harvest early to get higher protein contents because they wanted to use it as a protein supplement. And they can, you can do that. I mean, it's pretty close to a protein supplement at early boot stage. Um, energy levels, however, actually aren't quite the way most people would think of them for a forage. So here I, I have just flag leaf, which is before boot, boot and soft dough. And I really wanted to show you um, here we had um, the TDN levels going from 70 to 60. And that would make you think that there's a linear decline. And there's not. In fact, it's probably hard to see a little bit. But this is um, this right here is boot. And this is the energy level. And it starts decreasing all the way to when it puts the head out. And then we start seeing an increase. Um, so what I see some people making the mistake of harvesting, you know, in that late head stage when it's actually the lowest energy content you can get, you're picking up energy and you're picking up yield by delaying just a little bit. And that's because it's starting to put starch in the head. So you, you are losing forage quality, but you are gaining starch. So you're gaining energy out of the deal. So um, in this case, I do think that I didn't show you, but one of the other things that's important to understand is moisture contents when you're harvesting small cereals for silage. Uh, I see a lot of people who um, harvest it and they want to direct chop. And really, until you get to milk to soft dough, you can't direct chop it. Um, oftentimes, you'll have too much moisture, and so you'll get clostridial fermentation. Um, to get all that nasty smelling butyric acid and it makes it unpalatable. Um, so you either have to wilt it if you're going to harvest it earlier or wait to those stages and direct chop. So I think that's pretty much all the time I had. So I think I'm going to just uh, open it up and see what questions you guys may have for me. Mary, thanks uh, for being here with us today. Um, Druba, are there any questions? Yes, Eric, uh, we, have a, we have a question about rapeseed. So Mary, the question is, can you broadcast rapeseed mixes? If so, are seeding rates higher for mixed rapeseed in the coach for, like, for broadcasting? Yeah, so, um, so the question is, can I uh, broadcast seed rapeseed? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so you can um, actually, I would argue um, that brassicas are, are probably some of the best things uh, that you could use for broadcast seeding because they are such small seed size. They don't really need as much seed to soil contact as some of the others. So we see pretty good um, germination rates and establishment with broadcast seeded 
uh, rapeseed. So it's much like the purple top turnip. I know a lot of people use purple top turnip and radish in our seed corn fields. Um, I have some producers now that have started using rapeseed and I don't really see any difference in the establishment. Um, you might up, up the seeding rate a little bit, but I wouldn't go more than 20%. Um, so that means you're maybe like 3.2 pounds uh, rather than three pounds. So I wouldn't go too extreme. In this case, the smaller the seed size, the better they do in broadcast seeding. That's why red clover works well, uh, for instance, with broadcast seeding. Okay, we have uh, we have another question. For oat plus rapeseed, do you see for tissue degradation in late winter, such as mid January? So do you see any tissue degradation in the oat plus rapeseed? So I think I think the question that is is being referred to is: Do you see that, um, for instance, that the uh, brassica deteriorates? Uh -huh. um, more so yeah, yeah. over the winter uh, than the oats do. Um, you know, I don't have great data where we've had fields that we didn't graze. Um, we do see, uh, honestly, that after the killing frost, um, it seems like the cattle start selecting rapeseed. And so uh, by the time we get to January, we often don't have rapeseed left in the mix if we are not strip grazing. And in the fields that we strip grazed, I really didn't see a big difference in terms of, they look horrible. Uh, the rapeseed does not look good, uh, but I didn't see a big change in the proportion of rapeseed compared to oats when we were sampling ahead of our strips. So I'm, I'm going to say, I don't think we really see greater deterioration. I think it looks worse, but I don't think uh, the data actually supports that it is uh, deteriorating more readily. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Eric, so these are the two questions I have so far. Okay. Um, are there any other any other questions? Anybody else want to chime in before we move on? Well, hearing none, we'll go ahead and um, wrap up today's town hall. I really appreciate everybody being here with us today. Um, I just want to remind everybody, as, as always, that we um, we are simulcasting these town halls onto our MU Integrated Pest Management YouTube channel these days. And so for anybody that might find some value from the presentation today or any of the, those that they've heard, um, but are unable to, to join us at noon on Thursday, certainly it's not a great time uh, of day to, to be um, doing these presentations. Log on to log on to YouTube. Go to MUIPM. Um, if you if you really like the content, click that red subscribe button on the right side. That will give you a notification every time that we post a new uh, video or when our town halls are fixing to go live. We've we've put together about sixty of these videos now. So there's there's a whole wide variety of forage and livestock content relative to or that's that's related to uh, Missouri production agriculture that that you all could enjoy. We, we really thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Janowski, for, for taking time out of your day and joining us and enlightening us on, on the cover crop uh, grazing. Uh, certainly, I learned a lot about rapeseed today that I, I wasn't uh, familiar with before that. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up and we'll, uh, we'll see you all next Thursday. I believe we'll be talking about uh, rations for backgrounding calves um, in the fall of 2021. So have a good afternoon, everyone.